Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an enormous privilege for me to be here today in Dalian to talk to you about one of the most exciting pieces of space exploration in many decades, and that is the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission. Comets are these extraordinary objects left over from the beginning of the birth of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. They're beautiful objects which appear in the night sky seemingly randomly in historical terms, often enough that you may well see one or two in your lifetime, but not often enough that they come every week and you get bored with them. But on the other hand, there's a scientific basis to comets which is extremely important to us because our own solar system, when it was first born, the planet Earth was probably far too hot to retain any water during its formation or any complex molecules. But comets which were frozen far out in space maintained water and complex organic molecules and those potentially rained down onto the planet Earth maybe a billion years after its formation when it was cool enough. And everybody in this room could well be comet stuff, both the water in you and the amino acids which are in your bodies which make up the proteins could have originated in comets. And so exploring comets is very much this story about understanding our own origins. In 1986, the European Space Agency was the first to fly past a comet with its probe Giotto. It flew past the very famous comet Halley. It flew past at about 600 kilometers, but more importantly, it flew past at a speed of 68 kilometers per second. The technology we had then was only capable of a brief rendezvous. Comets are on highly elliptical orbits, go far out into the solar system and come back in briefly into the middle. And Imagine, if you want, uh, the, the speeds are so high that it would be the equivalent of you wanting to have a conversation with Usain Bolt. I think I can guarantee that nobody in the room would be able to run alongside him in the 100 meters and have a, meaning, a meaningful conversation with him. But you could have a brief one, at least, by waiting at the 50-meter line, standing out in front of him and getting one syllable out, perhaps, as he went past you. And that's what Giotto was in 1986. But we wanted to do more. We wanted to get next to a comet, rendezvous with a comet, escort it through the inner solar system, and understand its properties in great detail as it get, got to its closest point to the sun. And to do so, we built this machine. This is Rosetta. This is on, the, uh, on your left side is the spacecraft at the far end of the clean room there with one of the two solar panels, 32 meters in total, the width, the wingspan of an Airbus A320. And here is the spacecraft in its full scale, two and a half meter cubed, three tons, half of which is fuel. And there is the filet lander on the side, 100 kilos in size. And in 2004, we were ready to launch Rosetta. This was launched from our spaceport in Kourou in French Guiana on an Ariane 5, but even the Ariane 5 wasn't powerful enough to get where we were going directly. Where we were going was Comet 67P churyumov gerasimenko a comet which goes all the way out to the orbit of Jupiter at its furthest point from the Sun and in between the Earth and Mars as its closest point on a six and a half year journey. And so the Usain Bolt story is still true. With that rocket, we will not at a high enough speed to catch up with this comet. Instead, what we did was three rendezvous with the Earth and one with Mars in order to use the gravitational slingshot effect to power us onto the right orbit to catch up with 67P. And here's one of the pictures taken of the Earth in 2009. It's a very progressive social media aware mission at taking a selfie here uh, back in 2007 uh, with Mars in the background. Now, what we had to do after that was put the spacecraft into hibernation in 2011, far from the sun, not enough power to run the spacecraft safely. And we had to wait for two and a half years for the alarm clock to go off on board. We were not commanding the spacecraft, we were waiting to hear from it. This is a scene in the control room in Germany, 18 minutes after the signal was due to reappear. And you can see the anxiety on the faces there of the control team, uh, the flight operations team. There, the signal came, however, 18 minutes late, and the equivalent, of course, great joy and pleasure, because at that point, we knew we had a mission. We knew after 10 years flying through the solar system, we were on our way to 67P. And here are the first images taken from Rosetta as we approach 67P. We could see, indeed, it was a comet. There was some material flowing away from it. We hadn't mistargeted and gone to an asteroid instead. 
As we got close by, we began to see a very bizarre looking object. This is the origin of the name the rubber duck, which with the 67, 67P was named after. And it was at this point that, in fact, the scientists were getting very excited because they thought this could potentially be two comets joined together. And for the price of one mission, we were going to be able to study two. At the same time, the mission uh, operations engineers were extremely concerned because how on earth do you fly orbit around an object like this, which is not spherical at all? And it got worse when we got closer up in August when we rendezvoused. This is 67P, four kilometers across, an incredibly sculpted object, amazingly uh, diverse terrain. And we had to place a lander somewhere on this. And we were only able to place the lander, as you'll see in a moment, to the precision of one kilometer on a four kilometer wide object. So this was, an, again, great joy for the scientists and uh, some head scratching for the engineers at that point. This is the terrain of 67P, just a couple of pictures here to show this amazingly like, diverse landscape. It looks geological, it looks like it's rock, it looks like there are boulders rolling down hills. But keep in mind that this object has the density less than half that of water. It is a mixture of water ice, CO2, carbon monoxide, dust. It would float very high in the sea if we placed it in there. And the processes that give rise to this sculpting here are nothing like the geology we have on Earth. And indeed, the, the gravitational potential of this object, the gravitational field, is very uh, diverse as you move around. There are areas here where you say, you simply pose the question, where on an object like this is down? Look at these boulders over here. These boulders are obviously being pulled onto the side of the comet there, but equally there are boulders up there being pulled in a completely different direction. The gravity is extremely weak on this object, and this is one of my favorite pictures um, of the comet. The gravity on this comet is 100,000 times weaker than it is on the Earth. And so when you look at this 100 meter high cliff on the comet, your first thought, of course, everybody in this room is thinking base jumping, of course. And you could, you could base jump off this. You wouldn't need a parachute. It would take you 20 minutes to reach the bottom. It would be the most boring base jump in history. Um, and you wouldn't need a parachute. There's no atmosphere, but you would get to the bottom at, at less than walking pace, 25 centimeters a second. So you would just walk off the bottom. But here's the interesting point. Everybody knows, everybody that's done base jumping knows that when you do, you stand and you have to push up to get, make sure you don't hit any rocks just beneath you. So I'd ask you all at this point to stand up because I'm going to teach you how to jump off a comet. The danger is that if you jump just 0.9 meters a second, you will reach escape velocity. And you will not base jump. You will go and fly off into outer space. <laughs> to reach 0.9 meters a second, it's the equivalent of jumping just to four centimeters. If you can jump to four centimeters, you can jump off a comet. So we're going to do that together. One, two, three, up! you have just reached escape velocity from a comet. Well done. So everything we know about this object is affected by the low gravity, the cold, the temperature on this comet is extremely low when it's far from the sun, minus 100 degrees. But when it's close to the sun, it gets well above 300 degrees. The change in temperature is enormous. And of course, the comet is active. The closer it comes to the sun, the more the material, the volatiles, the carbon dioxide, the water, the CO, bursts out from under the surface and creates this activity. And this is important because, firstly, we want to understand this process, but we had to land before we got to this point because we needed to land before the comet got too active. So we had to pick a landing site, and again, I say we had to pick somewhere roughly a kilometer across on a four-kilometer wide object. This is the place we chose in the end. The circle here is a kilometer in diameter, and we were aiming right for the center here but of course, you can see how dangerous the terrain around us is as well. If we didn't hit the right place, there was always the danger that we would tumble and not land on the surface properly at all. This is the descent of Philae on November the 12th last year, as seen from Rosetta as Philae descends away towards the surface. And so after that, we actually see it traversing the surface, flying down towards this comet at a speed of one meter per second, just walking pace, a very slow drift down onto the surface. This is the, the final few meters from 69 meters down to nine. This took a minute in real time because again, we're falling at just one meter a second and that's nine meters across. You can see even at this scale, there are boulders, there are structures there. And in fact, what we think happened is that we hit that triangular boulder which you see more or less in the middle of the image. 
This is the touchdown point at 1534, a UT on November the 12th, 2014. You can see the three feet there. And you can hear the sound of landing, which I'm going to play for you now. This is as transmitted through the legs of the lander. And actually, that tells us an enormous amount what happened next, because we can get out of that the acceleration profile of the spacecraft. And we understand from that what happened next was we bounced. Because here we are, less than 10 minutes later, flying again. We flew up to heights of 200 meters above the surface of the comet. We flew for two hours in total. This is the, the, where we touched down in the top left corner there, and then where we brushed the edge of a cliff about one hour later. We started tumbling, and we came down into an area of the comet that in November last year was very dark. Philae landed in a shadowed location up against a cliff of pristine cometary material. And we ran the experiments from Philae, the laboratory experiments, to investigate this material. Lots of scientific papers have been published from both Philae and Rosetta by now. Philae then fell asleep because there wasn't enough power to power its solar panels. In June this year, it woke up again. As the comet approached the sun, there was enough power in this location to wake it up. We've heard six times from Philae then. We haven't secured a full connection uh, in order to be able to do more science with Philae at that point. But in the meantime, Rosetta, the big spacecraft, has been investigating the comet in enormous detail. At the time of landing, of course, there was enormous joy from around the world in the control room, the front pages of all of the newspapers. And at least part of that was driven by the fact that we ran, I think, a very innovative PR campaign within ESA, not only with social media engagement, um, but also we went to the degree of even making a science fiction film. If you haven't seen it, I recommend looking for Ambition online. If we have time at the end, I'm certainly willing to play a five-minute film for you. And also anthropomorphic cartoons which uh, played an enormous role in engaging children, and we know many adults are fans of these cartoons which we've put out. And explained the mission in great detail, but in a very personal form as well. So as we have proceeded, we've got to the point now where the comet has become more active, and this is just a representation of that activity as the comet has approached the sun. This is just the day before we approached the closest point to the sun on August the 13th this year. And you'll see a huge outburst from the comet this is what we're actually witnessing every day now. We're standing quite a long way from the comet because it's making it rather difficult for us to work close up. It confuses our star track as being in that cloud of dust and gas. But we've learned an enormous amount about this comet. And again, by doing so, we're learning about the origins of human beings on the planet Earth, dating back 4.6 billion years into the past. The mission is not over yet. By this time next year, we will end the mission in a rather spectacular fashion by landing Rosetta also on the surface of the comet, slowly spiraling down until we make contact. The mission will be over at that point. We'll have no way of relaying data back to Earth, but it's a fitting end to what has been one of the most extraordinary ex episodes in the exploration of our own solar system. And there is more to come. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, Mark, that was, uh, that was amazing. I guess one question I would ha have for you is, are there any surprising things that you've learned <clears throat> from actually having landed on the comet now that you weren't expecting? Well, from the landing, what we found were lots of organic molecules which have never been detected on the surface of a comet before uh, or in a cometary environment. So we're beginning to see these building blocks uh, of life. The, the, the analogy I make there is that, of course, the raw materials of life carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen are available uh, universally. <clears throat> but if you went to your local hardware store, imagine you went, let's put it this way, if you went to the forest near to your house and you set off a bomb, uh, you have all that raw, raw material there, the chances of it making life are you know, slightly unlikely. Um, but if you go to the local hardware store, you've got windows, doors, door handles, a refrigerator. Maybe you have the raw elements. Of course, what you have to do is blow it up again because that's when comets hit the Earth. There is that explosive event. But we actually think that promotes the formation of the more complex molecules. The, we have explo some the explosion. The explosion, the impact itself, yes. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Thank you very Mark. much. One thing I'll do is <clears throat> hand around a scale model of the comet for everybody to get tactile with. This is what the comet really feels like. All right, great, thanks. Uh, next, we have Brian Schmidt of the Australian National University, and he is going to take us to the far reaches of the universe. Right. 
Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, astronomy kind of uh, bridges the gap between the two speaker, other speakers today. As Mark has already shown you, the pristine Earth probably shed most of the interesting things from life's point of view. And so the comets that shed uh, water, but also probably amino acids, are the things that might bring life to planets. Now, astronomy is all about exploration. And one of the biggest possible questions we can explore as astronomers is the question about life around other planets or in other planets. And so, maybe, there we go. If you think about uh, our, as humans, we interact with the idea of alien life forms, of life around other planets throughout popular culture, through the ideas of aliens, through our movies and TV shows. Uh, but we're actually able, over the next 10 years, to go out and really start in detail asking the question, is there life out beyond the Earth? So here is Venus going across the sun. As Venus goes across the sun, it only does this every 100 years or so, it causes the sun to dim a little bit. Now, of course, when we look out into the sky, we see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of stars, and this same effect will occasionally happen. So we can go out and identify planets in this way. And the Kepler mission was sp specifically designed to do this. So the Kepler mission went out and looked at a big piece of sky in the northern hemisphere, and it used this technique to find many, many objects. Here is an example of a planet going front and dimming the light just a little bit. It's sensitive to one part in 100,000 or thereabouts. And it has found thousands of planets in this way. So as of about a month ago, we were up to almost 5,000 planets. And quite remarkably, we are beginning to find Earth-like planets. And our best estimate is that if you look like a star like the sun, on average, there is about one terrestrial planet per Earth-like or sun-like star. We have found many, many habitable, in principle, uh, exoplanets. These are uh, planets going from being a little smaller than the Earth to being quite a bit larger than the Earth, but made of rocks and located near their stars so that we think they have liquid water. So there are a lot of planets out there. Now, we can go and learn interesting things from these planets because we have 100 billion stars out there in our Milky Way, in our own galaxy alone. And let's think about what a planet looks like when it goes in front of its star. This is actually Venus going in front of our sun. And what you can see here is there is a rim of light. That rim of light is starlight refracting through the atmosphere and picking up the chemical signatures of that star. So that if we can look at that, we can actually identify the composition of the atmosphere and look for the signatures of life that we understand like ourselves, such as oxygen or perhaps something more exotic. We are going to find almost all of the nearby objects over the coming decade. Coming up very soon, we're going to have the TESS mission from NASA. That'll be launched in roughly 2017, followed by the European mission PLATO. And these will give us essentially the census of all the nearby planets. And then with the next generation of telescopes, 25, 30, or 40 meter telescopes that we're going to uh, be building over the next decade, we're going to be able to make the very sensitive measurements of seeing that tiny amount of light leak through a planet's atmosphere. And perhaps we will see oxygen, for example, in the next 10 years, a great signature of life. Now, these big telescopes can look for life around other planets, but they can do far more. They can allow us to look into the distant universe. And so the distant universe is actually quite interesting. With the Hubble Space Telescope, we can go in and see in a very tiny piece of space around 20,000 galaxies. And these galaxies extend back 12 and a half billion years in the past. That's how 
far away they are. Their light takes that long to reach us. But in the future, we're going to have an even bigger space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. And the James Webb Space Telescope, six and a half meters in diameter, will take a picture which we think will look something like that. And you can see the dark space has been filled in with lots of little dots. Those little dots, we think, are the first stars and galaxies. So we're literally going to be able to look at the universe being born. Now, I'm assuming when I say that, most of you are familiar with the idea of the Big Bang. But let's just do a quick cosmological primer. The universe is expanding, and that's something we've known about since 1929. If we think about it in the past, things will have been closer and closer and closer, and there will be a time when everything in the universe was on top of everything else, the time of the Big Bang. So there is a time, about 13.8 billion years ago, where the universe literally was created by some uh, act that we don't completely understand. If we go out and we look 380,000 years after the Big Bang, this is what we see. We see an image of the universe when it was roughly 3,000 degrees in temperature, before stars, before galaxies, and we're actually seeing sound waves ripple around a very hot universe. The universe becomes transparent as it expands and cools, and then 10 million years later, this is what it looks like. It's not very exciting. Well, it's actually, that's what it looks like to our human eyes. If you were to be able to look at it in radio waves, then you might actually see a very exciting pattern. And that's because hydrogen, which was created in the Big Bang, emits radio waves when it gets bumped around and its electron can get disoriented with its proton, and you get a 1.4 gigahertz radio wave, which, if we build a large enough telescope, we can detect. And we are building those telescopes as well, giant radio telescopes in places that have no radio uh, communications, for example, the very uh, barren parts of Western Australia. And here we're building telescopes that we put together using computers so that we don't have to make these giant structures that are giant parabolas. Instead, we can use computers to essentially uh, mimic the idea of a telescope. And so the Murchison Wide Field Array is looking for that detection of uh, hydrogen from the dark ages of the universe. But we're going to be building an even larger telescope with many, many countries in the world known as the Square Kilometer Array, which will be built uh, in Western Australia and in Southern Africa over the coming decade. I'm impatient, and so one of the things that I like to do is look for shortcuts in research. This map has been taken by a recent uh, European Space Agency mission known as Gaia. It's going through and it's looking at the properties of every single star it can see in the galaxy, billions of stars. The universe was created, it was made of hydrogen and helium. The first stars have no iron, they have no carbon, no oxygen. So this mission and a similar uh, thing we're doing in Australia, mapping the sky, is able to pick out the pristine early fossils of the universe. We can use the fossilized record to reconstruct how the Milky Way, our own galaxy, was formed and infer how the first stars came into being. Now, as these missions map the sky, they're mapping what is equivalent to the inside of a globe. We take literally petabytes of data and have to use quite complicated techniques to go through and analyze it. But of course, these satellites can also look down. The same process of mapping the globe, our Earth, is almost identical to looking up. And I'll stop there. <clears throat> So, Mark, you mentioned the, the, the new telescope is at the Square Kilometer Array. Yes. And it's being built in both Western Australia and South Africa. Is this yeah. like the binocular effect, stereoscopy? What, is it, <coughs> what does it do, uh, allow you to do distances better? Or? Unfortunately, in this case, what uh, we're doing is we have sort of different sites that have different uh, positive aspects. So the Western Australian site, there is no FM radio, and when we want to look at that hydrogen, we need to be clear of things like FM radio. Uh, but it's very remote and very hard to build huge amounts of infrastructure. So the Southern African site has a bit more ability to, for example, connect to power grids that we need. 
So the two different types of telescopes, it turns out you can't see all radio waves with one telescope. You need to have ones that have dishes. You need to have these, these dipoles, as we call them, <coughs> across the, uh, the desert as looking at uh, very low frequency radio waves. So we have two telescopes to see the whole spectrum. So these, um, you say that within the next decade or so, most of the planetary discoveries will be made. And then it's these, <coughs> all these new telescopes that are being built that will help qualitatively determine what it is these planets are or contain? Yeah, so we're going to be looking with these missions at all of the bright nearby stars. Yeah. So there's only several, you know, there's tens of thousands of them or hundreds of thousands of them. Some of them just will not have planets because they won't be lined up right. They'll be, you'll be unable to see planets even though they're there because they don't go in front of their stars. But the ones that do, we will detect. And then these next generation of big telescopes will be able to pick them off one by one. And it's going to take a long time because it turns out such a small fraction of the light is actually going through that atmosphere. You have to collect billions upon billions of photons to see the very subtle signature. But it appears we'll be able to do it. And so I think we have a very good prospect of determining how often lifelike what we have here on Earth occurs around these types of planets. It'll keep you busy for decades. Uh, huh? Yeah, we astronomers don't like to put ourselves out of business. Thank you.